So good morning, everyone who's listening via YouTube. This is the House Healthcare Committee, and we are doing our first video committee meeting. So bear with us. Uh, I think we have a general understanding of what we need to do to have this go well. Uh, we have all of our committee members here this morning, and uh, we are live on YouTube. So I think the first order of business is simply to uh, welcome our witnesses. We have, uh, we have scheduled, I'm looking, trying to look at my schedule in front of me. Um, so let, let me start first by saying just very quickly uh, that thank you to the committee members and uh, to acknowledge that the work that we did before we left the State House on House Bill 742 uh, proved to be very important in laying the foundation for moving ahead with emergency measures, some of which we're going to hear follow up about today and later next week. Um, and of course, we know that 742 became the vehicle for additional uh, legislation as well of emergency basis. Um, this morning, we're focusing on uh, insurance issues. Uh, in this time of dramatic changes, we want to make sure that we as a committee understand what has now been set in motion to try our best to ensure that Vermonters uh, whose lives have changed dramatically and suddenly continue to have as much access to health insurance as possible. Uh, our witnesses this morning include uh, uh, Sebastian, I don't think I've heard your last name pronounced before, so I'll just say Sebastian for now and let you introduce yourself. <laughs> well, we have the Department of Financial Regulation. Uh, then we here have the, uh, uh, from DIVA, we have Addy Stromolo, who's going to talk about the uh, open enrollment on the exchange. Uh, and we've asked Susan Gurkowski and Sarah Teachout to be with us to update us on changes that MVP Insur insurance and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont have made. Uh, we'll try our best to stay to our schedule, but I uh, appreciate your flexibility. So with that, uh, Sebastian, I would welcome you to introduce yourself by name and uh, what role you're playing. And I understand that you are prepared to walk us through an emergency rule that DFR has recently promulgated with regard to uh, some aspects of insurance. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sebastian and I'll remind committee members that if you have questions, uh, if you raise your hand on the screen and I'll try my best to track that, but let's first listen to Sebastian. So good morning and welcome Sebastian. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Representative Lippert. My name is Sebastian Arduengo and I am an assistant general counsel at the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, language in H-742 regarding DFR's uh, emergency rulemaking during the COVID-19 outbreak includes expanding patients' access to and providers' reimbursement for uh, healthcare services delivered remotely through telemedicine, telehealth, audio-only telephone, and brief telecommunication services. Um, for the last week, um, we have been working with stakeholders, including uh, the Vermont Medical Society, Bi-State Primary Care, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP Healthcare, and others to develop an emergency rule on uh, healthcare services delivered through these means. And I wanted to share with you um, what uh, the work we've done on that so far. So the, uh, the rule has been drafted and uh, we sent a draft out to the stakeholders for feedback. And um, I just wanna say thank you to all of the uh, stakeholders for their very timely and thoughtful input. And um, in response to that input, we made some changes to the rule, and that is what I'm going to share with you today. 
So the, Sean, the first can, can, Sean, can I interrupt? Just say that I do not believe we have seen the rule in its draft form. So if it's possible to review the rule generally, as well as changes that have been made by the stake stakeholder input, that would be helpful. I will uh, send the the draft and the uh, the red line uh, with the changes we made in response to uh, the stakeholder feedback to Demis, um, so you can take a look at that. Um, so what the what the rule does in in very broad terms is that it allows uh, health insurance plans to or requires health insurance plans to provide coverage for healthcare services de delivered remotely through telehealth or audio only telephone um, as though they were provided in person. So um, this is sort of the telephone office visit situation. And um, it also requires health insurance plans to provide the same reimbursement rate for these services um, using equivalent procedure codes as though the service was being provided in person. Uh, because these services are supposed to be equivalent to in-person office visits, uh, health insurance plans can charge the deductible copay or coinsurance that would be otherwise permissible if the service was being provided in person and um, health insurance plans have to cover the same number of telephone or telemedicine consultations as they would for in-person covered services for each covered person. Um, in addition, um, the um, health insurance plan has to notify members in advance that, or sorry, the, um, the health insurance plans may require practices to notify members in advance that services delivered remotely um, will be billed as an in-person visit, but um, the practices can permit providers to notify members during the same call and no other consent to receive remote services are required. Finally, with respect to the uh, in the telephone and telehealth office visits, um, health insurance plans can't require providers to have an existing patient relationship with a member. So um, to the extent that plans have existing member requirements for uh, telemedicine or telehealth, we're going to require them to waive those requirements um, during the duration of the um, COVID-19 outbreak. The rule also addresses coverage of telephone triage services. And these are brief calls where um, say a member is calling their provider to ask um, whether they need to go in or receive any follow-up services. Um, we are requiring health insurance plans to provide coverage and reimbursement for um, HCPCS code G2012, um, which is consistent with uh, guidance issued by Vermont Medicaid. And uh, this code covers virtual check-ins via telephone. And um, I think the biggest change between what we're doing and what Medicaid is doing that we are using, uh, we are requiring coverage of the G2012 code for both um, federally qualified health centers and rural health centers, as well as all other providers. So for commercial insurance, the idea is that all providers will use that code for telephone triage services. We are also um, requiring um, health insurance plans to waive any deductibles, co-pays, or co-insurance for telephone triage. With respect to coverage of store and forward, we are requiring uh, health insurance plans to provide coverage and reimbursement for HCPCS code G2010, 
which is uh, the remote evaluation of a recorded video or image. So the idea here is that if a member has a rash or something like that, they can take a picture of it and then send it to their provider. And then the provider can follow up later with a, a diagnosis or um, instructions to come in or pursue any follow-up treatment. And um, with that service, we are also instructing insurers to waive any applicable co-pays for the duration of the COVID-19 outbreak. We're also um, exercising our authority under H-742 to move up the, the implementation date for um, the store and forward provisions in the bill to May 1st, 2020, if a declared state of emergency related to COVID-19 exists at that time. And um, the reason that we chose May 1st as a date was to give um, the insurers time to implement that. Uh, so I think uh, that should strike balance between um, what the insurers need and what the provider community wants. We also addressed the issue of claims retroactivity in the emergency rule, and we are directing uh, all health insurance plans to process and reimburse appropriate claims for uh, telephone triage services and healthcare services delivered um, by remote means, um, i.e. Uh, telehealth office visits uh, retroactively to a date no later than March 13th, 2020, which would be consistent with Vermont Medicaid. And um, to the extent that any uh, state regulations require compliance with HIPAA as far as the devices used for telehealth or audio only telephone services. We are weighing this consistent with guidance issued by the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, providers will be able to utilize any non-public facing remote communication product that is available to communicate with Facebook or with uh, patients. So for instance, um, a provider could use Skype to provide telehealth services to a patient, but they could not use Faith Live. The rule also addresses mental health parity, and for the uh, mental health parity section, we have more or less parroted the, the language that is already in Vermont law in Title VIII, Section 4089B stating that um, health insurance plans cannot establish any rate, term, or condition that places a greater burden on an insured for access or treatment, access for or treatment for a mental health condition delivered remotely um, through telehealth, audio-only telephone, store and forward, or brief communication services. So that language is the, the same as in our um, mental health parity statute. And finally, um, we've addressed the physical location of remote services, uh, saying that health insurance plans cannot deny or limit coverage or reimbursement of healthcare services delivered remotely based solely on the physical location of the patient or the provider. Okay, does that cover the provisions generally? Yes, that was um, pretty much all of the major provisions in the um, emergency rule. Okay, can you you mentioned that it's a draft at this point? Can you talk about the uh, likely effective time, effective date, or what the plans are to have it become effective, and whether you've received all the stakeholder input that you had requested? Yes. Um, at this point, we anticipate 8742 to become law on Monday after review by the governor's office. Mm -hmm. 
and um, our plan is to have the rule become effective as soon as it's 740. We just lost you. We just lost your, your, your connection is frozen, Sebastian. Can you hear me? Now we can, I can hear you again. Okay. You, you had um, said it, it froze just at the point you said the law becomes effective, hopefully on Monday with the governor and then you intended and then it froze. Okay, our intent is to have it, this emergency rule become effective when 8742 becomes law. Okay, so this is all being done in anticipation, knowing what the contents of H42 authorize you to do. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, good. Um, okay, um, anything else you wanna add before we open it up to questions, Sebastian? Uh, no, I just uh, thank all of the stakeholders again for their, um, timely input on the rule and for um, helping to put it together so quickly. Okay. Can you, can you briefly, uh, before we open up, can you briefly uh, indicate the range, who the stakeholders were that you asked for input from? Again, Sebastian, you appear to be frozen without sound. I'm not sure there, maybe you're back. Um, I'm sorry about that. I've I have um, DSL internet at home, and my wife is teaching uh, school on another Zoom call at the same time. <laughs> yeah. It's... Okay. The, so I was asking um, about the range of stakeholders, and maybe if that's doesn't yeah. make sense to list. Uh, but let me ask this: Did did the healthcare advocates office were they, were they invited to have input? We did reach out to the healthcare advocate and um, we had significant input from the uh, provider community and from the insurers. Okay. I think at this point, let's um, open it up for questions. And I see that Representative Donahue, I'm going to unmute you, you have your hand up. Uh, if others have questions, uh, please indicate by quote, raising your hand and I will try to recognize you. Uh, Representative Donahue. I don't think, I'm hitting unmute. I don't know if it's actually. No, I think I had to unmute myself. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I wouldn't have thought of this question if it weren't that we had an, an email or some of us had an email inquiry the other day. Um, am I correct that after the new bill has passed, if an out of state physician uh, who can then ask for an emergency license for uh, practicing in Vermont and at that point, those services would also then be covered. So it's, it's my understanding as far as um, out-of-state position, physicians that um, the state has um, widened um, its request under the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. So that enables um, any physician or other provider that's licensed in any other jurisdiction in the country to uh, practice in Vermont. Um, and we also issued an emergency rule last week waiving um, provider credentialing requirements for insurance companies. That, so um, it is easier for um, insurers to bring um, out of network providers into the network for um, during the uh, COVID outbreak. So does that mean based on the emergency rule that could happen right now? It doesn't require action from um, the medical board. It just requires, it just means the insurer would be able to immediately credential. 
That's right. It means that the insurer wouldn't have to go through the credentialing requirements that are normally required um, as far as licensing and that there are fewer barriers to uh, reimbursement for those providers. Okay, great. We gave um, actually gave misinformation to the person who was inquiring because we thought they had to uh, wait for the law to be signed and for that provider to get uh, a temporary license, but that could happen right away. And I'll let that person know to contact their insurer. Okay, I see several other hands up. I'm gonna to go to Jen first in the event that you have something that you want to inquire about with regard to what we've been talking about. And I might, uh, there you go. Uh, Thanks. Um, so Jen Carby, Legislative Council. Um, I just wanted to clarify, I'm not familiar with the Emergency Medical Assistance Act that Sebastian was referencing. The language Sorry, it's is- the emergency, it's, it's the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. Emergency Management Assistance Compact, okay. Um, but the language of uh, H-742, would allow a, as soon as it's signed, would allow a uh, any provider who is licensed anywhere in the country to be deemed licensed in Vermont to provide services through telehealth or on the staff of a licensed facility without getting, without needing to get a temporary license or anything from the Board of Medical Practice or OPR. So understanding from them had been that was the way to allow people to um, begin practicing in Vermont or delivering services to Vermonters immediately using things like telehealth. And I would defer to the to DFR and the carriers as far as um, how the provider gets credentialed or gets the service covered for the Vermonter. Okay, I'm going to go to Representative Houghton. Uh, I believe you, I've, I've unmuted yep. you on my end. I'm good, thank you. So I have two clarifying questions, Sebastian. The first one is you, um, I thought you said waiving of copays, but I'm actually looking at the emergency rule online and it says a health insurance plan or a workers comp insurance plan may charge a copay. Um, so I just want to get clarification on, on what that is about. So there, there are two distinct types of telephone and telemedicine services. One is meant to um, be a stand-in for physical office, a you're, you're. telephone triage. So health insurers can charge copays for office visit equivalents, but cannot charge copays for telephone triage services. Okay. Great, thank you, that helps. And then my second question is, I, I, I kind of want to boil this down to how it helps providers and how it helps patients. So correct me if I'm wrong, for providers, this will mean they will be reimbursed from insurance companies for both telephone triage, as you call it, as well as other types of telemedicine and soon to be store and forward requirements as of May 1st. And for patients, it's going to help because they should have greater access to the healthcare providers while staying at home. Are those two statements accurate? That's right. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, I see that. So can you clarify again what the impact is on deductibles and out-of-pocket out maximums? The, uh, the rule does not address um, deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums, um, except to the extent that it says that normal cost sharing applies to um, office visits provided via telehealth or audio-only telephone. We are, um, we have a call scheduled on Monday with the provider community the healthcare advocate and the insurers to discuss waiving uh, cost sharing for the um, duration of the pandemic, but we did not address that particular issue in this emergency rule. 
Okay. And, but am I, was I, am I correct in understanding that with regard to specifics of COVID-19 testing and treatment, they have been waived apart from your rules? Yes, we issued a bulletin at the beginning, in the beginning right. of March that waives uh, cost sharing for COVID-19 testing, including um, any visits that are associated with that testing. Right, okay, so and just, if I can clarify at least again that the rule that you're, the, the, the draft rule, that emergency rule that you've been discussing with us is broadly applicable to telehealth services, not just re restricted to COVID-19 treatment and triage, et cetera. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, I think it's important when we discuss these that we understand what is broadly applicable to all health, health services and what is restricted, what, what changes may be restricted within, quote, COVID-19 treatment, uh, testing and treatment, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, I see Brian China has, Representative China has a question. I'm going to unmute you. I think you should be free to talk, Brian. Okay, thank you. So I think, Chair, I think you just asked a lot of the questions I was going to ask, um, okay. which, is, which is good, so I won't repeat them. I just, just for clarification, I am gonna ask um, if I heard this correctly, that currently telephone, uh, triaging telephone calls are, are free from cost sharing, that telemedicine equivalents to visits are not, but it's, but you said that the Department of Financial Regulation and insurers and, uh, and the healthcare advocate are meeting to talk about the idea of waiving um, cost sharing for the du duration of the pandemic. I don't know if I said exactly what you said. I, what What's unclear to me is, uh, are, are you saying that you are looking at the option of waiving all cost sharing or or all cost sharing associated with COVID-19? So H742 has three prongs as far as the department's emergency rules. And the emergency rule I was discussing just addresses the third prong, um, which is um, expanding access to telemedicine and audio only telephone. The uh, waiving of cost sharing I was referring to in my earlier testimony had to do with the first prong, which is um, waiving or limiting cost sharing requirements directly related to COVID-19 diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And then we'll have another call uh, with the stakeholders that is to be scheduled regarding the modification or suspension of health insurance plan deductible requirements for prescription drugs. And that's the, the second prong of the department's emergency rulemaking under 8742. Okay. Uh, um, is there any discussion of, of, of waiving the cost sharing for treatment for the mental health um, needs of people related to the pandemic? There's been no discussion of that uh, as of yet, but I expect that it will come up when we discuss the first prong of our emergency rulemaking authority with the uh, stakeholders. Are you set, Brian? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on to, I see that uh, Representative Rogers has a question. Uh, I'm unmuting, you should be. Uh, yep, I think. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you, Sebastian. I was just wondering, I know um, from the providers I've spoken with, there's there, some of them are just struggling with the lack of consistency, um, insure, one insurer to another. and. I know that DFR can, cannot regulate um, insurance plans that, that are covered under ERISA, but I was just wondering from your perspective if there are efforts being done to kind of mirror some of this work with maybe Cigna or other insurers that, that, that DFR cannot regulate or also to mirror 
between the on exchange and off exchange plans um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP. So the regulation um, would apply to all fully insured plans. So that would be plans that are on the exchange as well as large group plans. Unfortunately, we, uh, we don't have any authority, as you said, over self-insured plans under ERISA, but I suspect that that's something that will be addressed by the federal government in the next round of uh, COVID-related legislation to come out of Congress, just like how they addressed um, COVID testing in the legislation that uh, just went through the Senate this week. Okay, that's, that's helpful information to have. Thank you. I'm on okay, okay, we're, uh, I'm just going to note that we're approaching, not imminently, but within eight minutes or so of our time when we have scheduled uh, the Department of DIVA uh, to talk about open enrollment. And my understanding is that they have a fixed time that's available of 30 minutes. Am I, do I have this right? Maybe I don't. But why, why don't we go on, Amory, you have a question. And while you're asking your question, I will double check to make sure I have my time frames correct. So go ahead, Amory. Hello. You should be unmuted, Amory. Hello, now can you hear me? Yes. Yes, just to be clear, this is not just for COVID related diagnosis or treatment and triage. This is for if somebody has a heart problem and can't go into the doctor because of COVID, all these other pre existing conditions are covered under this. It's just not COVID stuff. That's right. This is a generally applicable rule. Um, it will apply to all healthcare services that are clinically appropriate to cover, uh, to provide via telehealth or audio only telephone. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any, not seeing any other hands raised, any further questions for Sebastian from DFR? Well, I'm gonna thank you, Sebastian. And uh, will we be able to stay in touch with you throughout this period of time as we are going to want to hear about develop further developments at DFR? You would be the contact and uh, appropriate person that we can ask to become a witness again at a later point in time. Yes, and I will send Demis a copy of the draft rule as well as the um, red line that we made in response to stakeholder input. Okay, hearing no other questions. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill, I'm sorry, uh, I have one last question, I'm sorry. Um, Sebastian, would it be possible to have you notify Demis who can notify us the day that you are putting this final, uh, when you're putting the finalized bulletin out? Sure, I can copy Demis on our mailing to the Secretary of State's office. Thank you. Yeah, that, that'd be good. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Uh, I think with that, we're a few minutes before our next witness, but as I said, they have a very fixed period of time, and I think we have a lot that we want to hear from them. So I think at this point, uh, Hearing nothing further, I'm going to say thank you, Sebastian, and you can uh, stay on and listen on if you, as you wish, but I'm sure you have other things you might want to do. Um, so committee, I'm going to just during the few minutes before, I mean, we're scheduled to hear from Addie Stromolo, who I do not see on our line yet, unless, oh yes, there, yes, I see Addie, you're on by, are you on by phone, Addie? I am. Hello. Okay. Um, are you 
So since you're on the line and I understood that you had a fixed period of time, is that correct? Perhaps we could start already and uh, start a few minutes early.